Have you ever wondered why evil exists in a world created by a perfect God? The answer might surprise you, and it is hidden in the pages of the Bible, in an epic story of cosmic rebellion that occurred even before the creation of mankind. Imagine a celestial kingdom in perfect harmony, filled with powerful and beautiful angelic beings created to worship and serve the Creator. Now imagine a third of these beings turning against their own Creator, led by one of the brightest and most powerful angels. What could lead such perfect creatures to rebel against an all-powerful God? And what did God do to these fallen angels? This is the story that the Bible tells us, a narrative that challenges our understanding and leads us to question everything we thought we knew about good and evil. Our journey begins at the beginning of everything, even before the creation of the physical universe we know. The Bible gives us precious glimpses of this primordial time, a period that challenges our understanding, limited by temporality, in this pre-creation era. In perfect harmony with its angelic creatures, beings of light and power that reflected various aspects of its infinite glory. The prophet Ezekiel offers us a fascinating and detailed description of one of the most magnificent beings ever created, a cherubim anointed to guard the very throne of God. In Ezekiel 28, 12-15, we read, You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, turquoise, sapphire, and diamond, jasper, agate, and amethyst. And your settings and mountings were made of gold, prepared on the day you were created. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. This description transports us to a realm of beauty and perfection, transcending our earthly imagination. Imagine a being so glorious that its mere presence lights up the heavens, a being adorned with the most precious jewels of creation, each reflecting a unique aspect of divine glory. The pure gold that adorned it symbolizes the purity and nobility of its original nature. This cherub, often identified as Lucifer, although this name does not appear directly in the Hebrew Bible, was beautiful and endowed with incomparable wisdom. Its position as a guardian cherub suggests it occupied a place of extreme honor and responsibility in the celestial kingdom, perhaps the closest to God among all the angelic creatures. The reference to the holy mountain of God and the fiery stones evokes images of a celestial realm of unimaginable splendor, where this magnificent being walked in perfect communion with its creator. This description gives us an idea of the magnitude of the fall that was to come and the cosmic tragedy that would unfold. The exalted position of Lucifer in heaven leads us to question how such a perfect being created by God and immersed in His presence, could choose to rebel? The answer to this question reveals a profound truth about the nature of free will and the consequences of choices. Ezekiel 28.17 gives us a clue. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Therefore I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Here we see the birth of sin, not on earth, but in heaven itself. Pride, the root of all evil, found a place in Lucifer's heart, corrupting his perfection and triggering events that would change the course of creation. This verse reveals that even the most perfect beings, when endowed with free will, have the capacity to choose evil. Lucifer's pride led him to see himself not as a reflection of God's glory, but as the source of that glory, he began to believe that his beauty and wisdom resulted from his merits, forgetting that everything he possessed was a gift from the Creator. But what led Lucifer to rebel against God? Isaiah 14, 12-14 details his ambitions. 
How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn! You have been cast down to the earth, who once laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. These words reveal Lucifer's insane desire to usurp God's throne, to become equal to the Creator, an ambition as absurd as it is tragic, for how could a creature equal its Creator? This verse gives us insight into the mental process that led to Lucifer's fall. He was unsatisfied with being the most beautiful and wise of the angels. He wanted to be God. His boundless ambition closed his eyes to his created nature's reality. He forgot that all his glory was but a reflection of God's glory, and in his pride he believed he could rise above his Creator. Lucifer's rebellion was not solitary. He convinced a third of the angels to join his cause. Revelation 12.3.4 gives us a symbolic view of this cosmic event. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The stars in heaven here refer to the angels who allied themselves with Lucifer in his rebellion against God. It is hard for us to imagine the scale of this celestial conflict, where beings of immense power and intelligence chose to turn against their Creator. How did Lucifer manage to convince so many angels to follow him? We can only speculate, but it is likely that he used his position of leadership and his persuasive skills to sow doubts and discontent among the angels. Perhaps he promised greater freedom or power or questioned God's goodness. Whatever his tactics, the result was a catastrophic division in the celestial kingdom with consequences that would extend throughout eternity. God's response to this rebellion was swift and decisive. Revelation 12, 7 to 9 describes the battle. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. This event marked the fall of Lucifer, now known as Satan, which means adversary, and the angels who followed him, now called demons or evil spirits. The battle in heaven must have been an unimaginable spectacle, with powerful angelic forces clashing in a cosmic conflict. Michael, one of God's archangels, led the loyal celestial forces against Satan and his followers. The outcome was never in doubt. God, in his omnipotence, could have crushed the rebellion instantly. However, he allowed the battle to take place, perhaps to demonstrate to all celestial beings the consequences of rebellion and the futility of opposing the Creator. The expulsion of Satan and his followers from heaven was not the end of their story. God, in his infinite wisdom and for reasons that often escape us, allowed them to continue to exist, albeit with limited power and freedom. Second, Peter 2.4 gives us a clue about the fate of some of these fallen angels. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, this verse suggests that some rebellious angels were immediately confined, awaiting final judgment. The Greek term translated as hell here is Tartarus, a place of torment and confinement for the most wicked spiritual beings. This is not the same as Hades, the realm of the dead, or Gehenna, the lake of fire of the final judgment. Tartarus appears to be a temporary prison for these fallen angels, where they await their final judgment. The idea that some angels are chained suggests that their activities have been severely restricted by God perhaps because their crimes were particularly heinous 
or because their freedom would pose too great a threat to God's creation. However, the scriptures also indicate that not all the fallen angels were immediately imprisoned. Satan and many of his followers have a certain freedom of action. In Job 1, 6 to 7 we read, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. This passage reveals that Satan has access both to the heavenly realm and to the earth, although his position has drastically changed since his fall. The book of Job offers us a fascinating insight into God's and Satan's interactions. Here we see Satan presenting himself before God, along with the other angels, suggesting that he still has some access to the heavenly realm. However, his position is clearly different. He is no longer the guardian cherub, but an accuser, an adversary. God's question and Satan's answer reveal that he is allowed to roam the earth, observing and influencing human affairs. This freedom, however, is not unrestricted. As we will see in the rest of the book of Job, Satan can only act within the limits set by God. The activity of the fallen angels on earth is a recurring theme in the scriptures. They are portrayed as beings actively seeking to distance humanity from God and thwart his plans. In Ephesians 6.12, Paul warns, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This passage reminds us that although invisible to our eyes, the fallen angels are a real and dangerous force. Paul uses military language to describe the nature of the spiritual conflict we are engaged in. The terms rulers, authorities and powers suggest an organized hierarchy among the demonic forces, perhaps reflecting the celestial order from which they fell. The reference to the heavenly realms indicates that this conflict is not limited to the earthly realm, but extends to the spiritual domain. This spiritual warfare is not a physical battle, but a struggle for humanity's mind, heart and soul. The fallen angels seek to lead people away from God through temptations, lies and deceptions, working behind the scenes to influence events and decisions that affect the course of human history. One of the most intriguing episodes involving fallen angels is found in Genesis 6, 1-4. When men began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and chose for themselves those they liked. In those days, there were Nephilim on the earth, and also afterwards, when the sons of God had relations with the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the heroes of old, men of renown. This passage is one of the most controversial and mysterious in the Bible. Many scholars interpret the sons of God in this passage as fallen angels who became involved with human women, resulting in a race of giants known as the Nephilim. This interpretation is supported by various ancient traditions and by references in other biblical texts, such as Jude Tut 1, 6 to 7, which speaks of angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own homes and engaged in sexual immorality. If this interpretation is correct, it represents an extreme transgression of the barriers between the spiritual and physical realms, a violation of the natural order established by God. The Nephilim, described as heroes of old men of renown, seem to have been beings of great power and influence, possibly contributing to humanity's increasing corruption before the flood. This event demonstrates the ongoing desire of the fallen angels to corrupt God's creation and interfere with his plan for humanity. This event seems to have been so grave in the eyes of God that he decided to intervene drastically. Genesis 6, 5, 7 reports, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. 
The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. This decision led to the flood, an event that not only judged the corrupted humanity, but also was a response to the interference of the fallen angels. The language is strong and vibrant, describing God's regret and pain at seeing the extent of corruption on earth. It is important to note that God's regret does not imply a mistake or a change of mind in the human sense, but expresses his deep sorrow and disapproval in the face of sin. The flood serves as a powerful reminder of God's holiness and intolerance of sin, as well as his willingness to intervene directly in human history when necessary. After the flood, the activity of the fallen angels has changed. While direct interaction with humans, as described in Genesis 6, is no longer mentioned, we see their influence continuing in other ways. In Deuteronomy 32.17, Moses warns the people of Israel, they sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods that came recently, whom your ancestors did not fear. Here, we see the fallen angels posing as gods, diverting the worship due to the Creator to themselves. This tactic represents a significant change in their strategy. Instead of interacting directly with humans, as before the Flood, the fallen angels now operate behind the scenes, manipulating humanity's religious and cultural systems. They exploit the human tendency toward idolatry, presenting themselves as deities worthy of worship. This form of deception is particularly dangerous because it corrupts human behavior, their spiritual understanding, and their relationship with the true God. In the New Testament, we find Jesus frequently confronting and expelling demons. Mark 1, 23-26 recounts one of these encounters, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. These encounters demonstrate Jesus' power and authority over the fallen angels and his mission to free humanity from their influence. Notably, the demons immediately recognize who Jesus is, calling him the Holy One of God. This suggests that the fallen angels still have a deep knowledge of spiritual reality despite their rebellion. The demons fear, have you come to destroy us? indicates they know their ultimate fate and Jesus' role in their judgment. The ease with which Jesus expels the demon demonstrates his supreme authority over all spiritual forces, good or bad. The question many ask is, why does God allow the fallen angels to continue to exist and influence the world? The scriptures do not give us a direct answer, but we can infer some reasons. First, the continued existence of the fallen angels serves as a testament to God's justice and patience. In 2 Peter 3.9, we read, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Although this verse primarily refers to humans, it gives us insight into God's character. His patience in dealing with evil demonstrates his desire to allow everyone to repent and turn to him. Furthermore, the fallen angel's continued presence highlights the gravity of sin and its consequences. Seeing the fallen state of these once glorious beings reminds us of the destructive power of rebellion against God. Additionally, the presence of fallen angels in the world serves as a test and an opportunity for humanity to grow. James 1.12 encourages us, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, 
that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Resisting the temptations and influences of the fallen angels strengthens our faith and brings us closer to God. This process of temptation and resistance is an integral part of developing spiritual character. By facing and overcoming demonic influences, believers learn to trust more fully in God and to rely on His strength. Furthermore, the presence of evil in the world allows us to exercise free will meaningfully. By choosing to follow God in a world influenced by evil forces, we demonstrate our love and loyalty to Him in a way that would not be possible without temptations or spiritual challenges. It is important to note that while God allows the fallen angels to continue to exist and exert some influence in the world, He has set clear limits on their activities. The book of Job provides us with a clear example of this. In Job 1-2, we see God setting limits on Satan's actions. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. This passage demonstrates that although Satan has some freedom to act, he can only do what God allows. This reminds us that despite their apparent freedom, the fallen angels remain under the sovereign control of God. They cannot do anything without His permission, and all their actions ultimately serve God's purposes, even in ways we may not fully understand. This truth comforts believers assuring us that no matter how powerful the forces of evil may appear, they are never beyond God's control. The scriptures also teach us that the final destiny of the fallen angels is already determined. In Matthew 25:41, Jesus speaks of the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This verse reveals several important truths. It confirms that there is a final judgment awaiting the fallen angels. It indicates that this judgment will result in eternal punishment. It suggests that this destiny was specifically prepared for them, implying that it was never God's intention for humans to share this fate. The eternal nature of this punishment reflects the severity of rebellion against an eternal and holy God. It is a solemn reminder of the ultimate consequences of sin and rejection of God. However, it is important to note that this judgment is still in the future. Until then, the fallen angels continue to operate in the world, although within the limits set by God, as they await their final judgment. The fallen angels remain active in the world, seeking to thwart God's purposes and lead humanity astray. The Apostle Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, 15, and no wonder Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. This passage alerts us to the deceptive nature of the fallen angels. They do not openly present themselves as forces of evil, but often disguise themselves as good seeking to deceive even the most vigilant. This may include promoting philosophies and ideologies that seem noble and just on the surface, but, in reality, lead people away from God. It may also involve using false or deceptive spiritual experiences to lead people away from the true worship of God. This ability to disguise makes the fallen angels particularly dangerous and highlights the need for spiritual discernment among believers. Despite the ongoing influence of the fallen angels in the world, the scriptures assure us that their final defeat is certain. The book of Revelation gives us a vision of this final victory in Revelation 20.10. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This verse describes the final destiny of Satan, and by extension, all the fallen angels. It fulfills the promise made in Eden, where God declared that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head, Genesis 3.15. This final victory is not just over Satan, but over all the evil he represents. 
It is the culmination of God's redemptive plan, the moment when all of creation will finally be freed from the corrupting influence of sin and death. It is crucial to understand that although the fallen angels are powerful, they are not omnipotent, omniscient, or omnipresent like God. They are limited creatures, however powerful they may be compared to humans, 1 John 4.4 4 reminds us, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. This verse assures us that God's power within us is greater than any power that the fallen angels can wield. This does not mean that we will not experience struggles or temptations, but it gives us confidence that with God's help, we can resist and overcome the evil influences in our lives. This truth is a call to vigilance and ongoing reliance on God, recognizing that our victory over the spiritual forces of evil does not come from our strength, but from God's power working in us. The story of the fallen angels teaches us important lessons about the nature of sin and its consequences. We see that even beings created in perfection with direct knowledge of God can choose to rebel. This highlights the seriousness of free will and the responsibility that comes with it. It also shows us that pride, the desire to rise above our created position, is the root of all sin. The fall of Lucifer and his followers serves as a solemn warning to us. Ephesians 4.27 warns us, Do not give the devil a foothold. This warning acknowledges that although we cannot be possessed by demons as believers, we can still give them opportunities to influence our lives through our choices and actions. Therefore, we are called to vigilance, guarding our hearts and minds against the subtle influences of evil. At the same time, the fallen angel's story highlights God's incredible grace and love. While the angels who sinned were immediately condemned, God chose to redeem fallen humanity. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This verse gains new depth when considered in light of the fall of the angels. God did not offer redemption to the fallen angels, but sent his own Son to die for the sins of humanity. This underscores the incomparable value God places on us and the extent of his love. It also reminds us of the seriousness of rejecting this offer of salvation. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, how much more serious will the judgment of those who reject his Son be? Understanding the fallen angels' reality and ongoing influence in the world should lead us to a life of spiritual vigilance and dependence on God. Ephesians 6, 11 to 12 exhorts us, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This passage reminds us that we are involved in an ongoing spiritual battle. The armor of God mentioned here includes truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. Each piece of this spiritual armor is essential for resisting the strategies and attacks of the fallen angels. Prayer also plays a crucial role in this spiritual battle. Paul continues in Ephesians 6.18, encouraging us to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. This constant dependence on God through prayer keeps us connected to the source of our spiritual strength and helps us discern and resist evil influences. As we conclude our exploration of the story of the fallen angels, we are left with a deeper understanding of the spiritual reality surrounding us and our place within it. The conflict between good and evil is a philosophical abstraction and a cosmic reality with eternal consequences. The fall of Lucifer and his followers serves as a solemn warning about the dangers of pride and rebellion against God. 
At the same time, God's response to this rebellion, allowing the fallen angels to continue to exist, but limiting their power and preparing their final judgment, reveals his justice, patience, and supreme sovereignty. More importantly, the contrast between the fate of the fallen angels and the offer of redemption to humanity through Jesus Christ highlights God's incomparable love for us. This story calls us to constant spiritual vigilance, deep dependence on God, and renewed appreciation for our salvation. While the fallen angels chose to rebel against their Creator and now face eternal judgment, we have the opportunity to choose reconciliation with God through Christ. This is truly the good news of the Gospel, that despite the reality of evil and the influence of the fallen angels in our world, we have the promise of God's ultimate victory and the hope of eternal life in His presence. May this understanding inspire us to live with purpose, faith and gratitude. We should always be aware of the spiritual battle around us, but confident in the power and love of God that sustains us. We have reached the end of our video, and I hope you like it. If you're looking for inspiration, knowledge and spiritual connection, don't let this opportunity pass you by. Subscribe to our channel now, leave your like and comment to strengthen our community. And if you want to help us continue sharing religious stories that touch hearts, become a channel member. Together we can make a difference and strengthen our spiritual journey. We're counting on you. We've left the link in the description of this video so you can become a member today. Continue watching videos about the history of the Bible. I will leave two recommendations here on the screen. God bless you. We will get to the next video.